We're in First Samuel thirty one. First Samuel thirty one. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful for the blessings of a new day. We're thankful for the beautiful sunshine this morning. We're thankful, Holy Father, for the things that we're seeing as it relates to spring, how things begin to get green again. We're thankful for the physical blessings of the past week. More importantly, Holy Father, we're thankful for your loving kindness shown toward us, your watch care over us, and the spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus. We pray now as we begin our study, Holy Father, that you would bless us in our efforts as we look back at things that happened long ago, but still have lessons that we can learn for our lives today. We pray for strength. We pray for courage. We pray for wisdom. We pray for those, Holy Father, who are less fortunate, those who are struggling physically and spiritually. Thank you for loving us, Holy Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Philistines fought against Israel. We read verses like this about the battles of long ago, and we really have a hard time making that connection unless we maybe have seen some movies. I can remember when I first saw Braveheart and saw how those men of that day fought those battles. It gives you a, a better appreciation for just how brutal those wars were and how you you better be as, as in good a shape as you possibly could because if not, it was definitely going to be survival of the fittest. You had to be skilled at the things you did. So this battle is going on. And at this point in time, the men of Israel, they're fleeing from before the Philistines in verse 31. And they fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. That is going to be close to a particular area or city that is going to be mentioned shortly. Saul is injured. In fact, to the point that the Bible points out in verse 3, he's wounded and likely dying because he's been shot by archers. His sons, at least three of them, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, are all killed in battle. Saul, feeling like he's going to die, says to his armor bearer, verse 4, draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he likewise fell upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons and his armor bearer, and all his men, that same day, together. Notice the effect of the death of Saul, his sons, and all that were with him. When the men of Israel, that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were beyond the Jordan, Saul heard about, knew of that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. You remember when we studied about 
the children of Israel coming into the land, that the first thing that they area that they came into was that area the other side of the Jordan River, a river that an area that was eventually occupied by two and a half tribes. Remember? Because they had a lot of cattle. They decided, hey, we want this area here, but they were going to have to go over and they were going to fight. Remember who those two and a half tribes were? Reuben, Ephraim, and Manasseh. There was a half tribe over there, and there was two other tribes that are on the other side of the river. Anybody have maps in the back of your Bible? You might have a map, and you might have something that, as it pertains to the the 12 tribes of Israel. And I think if you look at that map, you're going to see Reuben, you're going to see Gad, and you're going to see the half tribe of Manasseh. They're, they're on the other side of the river. So even that far away, once word got to them as far as what was happening, what had happened, even the people that lived beyond the valley, the other side, even the people beyond the Jordan, they left their cities. And when they did, that allowed the Philistines to inhabit their cities. So if you, if you picture the land of Israel, you sort of are going to have a division now of the north and south right now. At this point in time, the south is sort of going to be occupied by Philistines for the most part. And of course, again, you would have some of God's people up there. That's not where David is. We'll see where he is in a moment, but that's what's happening now. It came to pass, verse 8, on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul, verse 8, and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off Saul's head. They stripped off his armor. And they sent into the land of the Philistines round about to carry the tidings into the house of their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. And they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. If you wanted to this afternoon, you remember, you can Google Beth Shan and the remains of that city sitting up on a hill overlooking another Ro Ro what ended up being a Roman city that was destroyed in the earthquake that happened years ago. You can still see some of the ruins of Beth Shan. It was here that you have the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons. I'm assuming they were headless as well, but the Bible doesn't say anything about what they did with Jonathan and the other two sons. But as far as Saul's head was concerned, they cut it off. When the men or the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, verse 11, heard concerning him, that which the Philistines had done to Saul. All the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the wall of Bethshan. And they came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. As you read that, did you ask yourself the question, why would the men of Jabesh, Gilead, do such a thing? Was that not dangerous for them to go and, and get these bodies? And do you think they just let them just come in and just have the bodies? Probably not. So why do such a thing? What would have motivated them? Turn back to 1 Samuel 11. When Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. 
And so this guy Nahash says, okay, I'll do that, but there's one condition as far as this covenant is concerned. All you must put out your right eye. And they said, hmm, well, can we have seven days to think about that? Verse 3. So they come home, verse 4, and they spoke these words in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voice. Saul then comes back from the field. He's been anointed already, but he's not serving as king yet. He's still doing work, common work. He comes back. He sees everybody crying, upset. He goes, what's going on? And so they tell him about what's been said. And the Spirit of God came mightily upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was kindled. He took a yoke of oxen, cut them up, sent them around the country of Israel, and he said, you know what? This is what's going to happen to anybody who doesn't come up and join forces with me. And everybody got pretty scared when they saw that. 330,000 show up for, for service. And they said to the men of Jabesh Gilead in verse 9, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you'll have deliverance. And so the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh. And the men of Jabesh said to the Nahash, the Ammonite, tomorrow we will come out unto you and you shall do with us all that seemeth good to you. So gave the impression that we got a deal in regards to this covenant. We're going to put out our right eyes and we're going to be joining forces with you. And so it was so on verse 11 that Saul put the people in three companies. I guess that'd be about 110,000 apiece. They came into the midst of the camp, smote the Ammonites into the heat of the day. And it came to pass that there remained, that they that remained were scattered so that not two of them were left together. It seems to me that may be the best ex, ex, exclamation. That may be the best, what's the word I want? That's what I want in regards to why on this occasion, when this happened and Saul and his son's bodies are now fastened to this wall, that these valiant men of Jabesh Gilead, based upon something that Saul has done, had done for them years ago, in regards to not only them, but also their people, rose up, came and did whatever was necessary at nighttime to steal back, to take those bodies back, and gave them a proper burial. Any comments on that? Yes, sir. He's going to do that. You're exactly right when we get to chapter 2. You're right. And it came to pass, 2 Samuel chapter 1, after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites. Now that takes us back. Again, remember the Amalekites had come to Ziklag. That was a city that had been given to David when David decided to go live amongst the Philistines. And Achish gave him a city to live in, in a foreign land amongst foreign people. That's where he's living That's where he lived until one day him and his people left. They were gone for a few days. And while they were gone, the city was raided, burnt. Everything everything that he had, his two wives and all their possessions, they were taken from them. And so then they had to fight a battle and they, they got everybody back. Nothing was lost. He even came back, 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 26. He came back to Ziklag. And you remember he sent gifts again to various people who lived around Judah for all the favor that they'd showed him in the past. So verse 1 sort of just is still talking about that. He, it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that David had abode two days in Ziklag. And it came to pass on the third day, that behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and he did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, 
tell me. And he answered, the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul was leaning upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called unto me, and he, I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me, Stand, I pray thee, beside me, and slay me. For anguish had taken hold of me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood beside him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord. And David took hold of his clothes and rent them and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted unto even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of Jehovah and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner, an Amalekite. And David said unto them, How wast thou not afraid to put forth thy hand to destroy Jehovah's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him so that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain Jehovah's anointed. As we read in 1 Samuel chapter 31, the Bible says that, again, that Saul was, was going to die based upon the being injured by the archers. Ask his armor bearer, to finish the job, when he would not, Saul falls on his own sword, and the Bible says, Saul died. So when we come to 2 Samuel chapter 2, and this man comes to David and begins to tell him the events that happened, how do we marry the two? Well, you got two choices here. One you conclude that everything that this man is saying in 2 Samuel chapter 1 is just a what? It's just a lie. And if you decide to go with that, then you're not wrong. Or you might decide that this man actually happened upon Saul. And even though Saul had run himself through and actually was trying to finish the job, didn't. And this man did. And if you would conclude that, I'd say, you know what? Good chance you're right. I do not know. I do not know. But let's just look at it from the moment, from the standpoint of, let's just say Saul wasn't dead just yet. He's dying, but even he wasn't able to finish the job. David is so still interested in the things that are going on as far as the battle is concerned. This man comes as far as his appearance is concerned. His clothes are rent. Earth is upon his head. So he, he's demonstrating remorse. He's demonstrating that things haven't gone well. And when he comes before David, what's the first thing he does in David's presence? He bows before him. Think about that for a moment. He bows before him. Maybe he thinks he's going to be the first to pay obeisance or honor to who is going to be king. And that's kind of ironic because he's actually going to be the first that the king executes or calls out a death sentence. David says to him, where'd you come from? Remember, this man is not a soldier. This man was not a part of this battle. He's a passerby. That may give us 
a little bit inside as far as whether or not his story was true or not. How, how did that just happen, that he just happened to be passing by? Well, he said, I'm coming out of the camp. That's where I escaped. And he wants to know, how did things go? Tell me. And of course, then either David sort of knows some of the things that have happened, but he's just needing confirmation. Here's somebody who's going to be able to give him a first hand witness. He says the people are fled. Many people are dead. And now Saul and Jonathan are dead. You think about how he would convey this to him. In his mind, Saul is what to David? An enemy. Because again, we know what Saul's been trying to do to David all this time. And Jonathan, when he mentions that name, I mean, there's, there's his dear friend, right? Nothing, nothing else said about the other two sons of Saul. Only the two characters really that are going to have any significance as far as David's life is concerned. And David said, how do you know? And then he begins to say, well, I, by chance... I happened upon Mount Gilboa. We know he's there. It's, it's, it's evident he's there. He's going to have something in his hand that shows he's been there. I came to this area. Saul is leaning upon his spear. Well, that, that seems to, to go with what we had read. That's what Saul would have been doing. The chariots and the horsemen were, were close. Saul says, I'm not, he wasn't dead yet. He sees me. He says, who are you? And he says, I'm an Amalekite. And he says, stand beside me. Again, for anguish has taken hold of me. My life is yet whole. So I stood beside him because I was sure he could not live. And he finished the job. What kind of man was this again? An opportunist, An opportunist but of what nationality? If, if by chance... In chapter 31, Saul didn't die. And if by chance this man is telling the truth, if that's the route we go, isn't it, a, isn't it ironic that an Amalekite is finishing off Saul in light of that command that Saul was given years ago regarding the Amalekites, you go and utterly destroy them. And had he done that, there wouldn't be an Amalekite to finish off the job. This isn't the first time we've seen that happen. I do not know, but it is sort of interesting that it is an Amalekite. What does he have as proof that he was close to Saul? Have you thought about that? Now, again, Saul was a warrior. Remember, we even looked. We even looked back, and I'll, I'll go back because even Brother George reminded us that when it came to Saul, when God was with him before that spirit, the the Holy Spirit had departed from him, and an evil spirit now possessed him from time to time. Remember back in chapter fourteen of First Samuel, there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any mighty man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. One idea was he just gathered the strongest. The other was that when they had these kind of battles, he picked out the biggest guy on the other side and said, I'll take him. You guys take the rest. He was a warrior. And yet he's in battle. And seemingly, what is on his head? His crown. And some of his other stuff on his forearms. I, I don't know. Wouldn't that make you a target? I mean, wouldn't people know? There's the king. Of course, he would have probably been head and shoulders of everybody else. But with that crown on his head, he, he really probably stuck out. I wonder what Saul's thinking at this point in time as far as maybe I would use just having the audacity or whatever the right word is to wear those things. Maybe it was maybe it was just how it worked. I read of other times where kings tried to disguise themselves so that they wouldn't be known to be the king because they knew they'd be like sitting ducks. But this crown is on his head and the bracelet is on his arm. And he's brought these. Now his story is, I've brought these to you. Well, you think about how this 
if we're still saying this is how the story unfolds, when this is said and now everybody hears this, what, what might people have thought David's reaction would be finally at this point in time? That Saul is dead. Celebration? Rejoicing? I mean, we've just spent how many weeks looking at all these various attempts that Saul has made on David's life. Saul has taken away any normality to David's life. David has been on the run. He hasn't been able to enjoy a family. He hasn't had to be able to be at home. He's lived amongst heathens. Saul's taken basically everything away from David. And yet all that time, you look at that man after God's own heart, what did he, how did he repay Saul? With evil? No, with good. And now in a time where you think, okay, that's it. You know, finally, his reaction is, tears his clothes, and all the men that were with him do likewise. They mourn. They cry. They don't eat. Why? Because Saul's dead, and because Jonathan is dead, and because the people of Israel have fallen before have fallen by the sword. He comes back to the young man, he says, Who are you? He said, I'm the son of a sojourner. And the question that David asked for him is, How were you not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy Jehovah's anointed? And so David says to one of his young men to go near to execute him. He did, and in essence, David says, Thy blood be upon your own head, for your mouth has testified against thee. Because you said, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Thoughts on that? Yes, sir, Brother Jim. I guess I'm a skeptic, but there was no doubt in my mind that the guy was lying. Uh, first, of all, he had to be an account. that away it says that it's, uh, it says, and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead he also fell on the sword and died with him and this guy says oh I just have to be up here here's Philistines closing in and that you know Saul was reacting you know he said unless unless I'm dead shortly these guys will come in mutilate yeah. me whatever and and this guy says, oh, I just have to be in the neighborhood, you know. And here, here's, he describes Saul as standing there holding the spear. You know, it, it doesn't jive at all. So, again, I think Brother Jim points out, I guess we could get a show of hands. I, I believe probably that's the way the majority would side with that. There's no doubt, no doubt about, no doubt about that. But you could see the armor bearer. You could see Saul falling. He's already wounded from arrows. And then, I don't even know what that would even be like to thrust yourself through, not with his spear, but with his sword, right? And just that initial shock of doing that could be enough to where you would seem to pass out or faint or basically give out to some extent. And then if I'm the armor bearer, I could look then at that point in time and how I'm not going to go over there and put my thumb on his you know, in his neck and see if I still got a heartbeat or something like that. I'm going to conclude what? He's dead. In that moment, he's dead. And I'm going to then just follow suit. And then guess what? I'm dead. I'll never even see this guy that comes along. Who could have? But again, I, 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 if, if, I had to, if I had to put my eggs in a certain basket, I'm going with what Brother Jim said. But again, if you would read the next chapter and you would have thought, well, I, I kind of kind of believe that guy's story. Well, okay, I'm, I'm not going to say, well, what are you thinking? Because you could be right. And it doesn't really matter either way. But no matter what, you think about how he thought it was going to turn out. I've got the crown. I've got this piece. I've brought it to you. I'm doing you honor by bowing down before you. And if it was all a lie, what's he expecting through this deception to receive. I mean, he's going to be honored. He has taken care of the greatest enemy David ever had. Now David's 
ascent to the throne is what? It's a done deal. In fact, here's the crown. Put it on your head. You're king now. And I'm the one that helped you get there. And he turns to him and says, you never should have done that. Somebody killed Saul, his sons, that is against God. His wishes. That's right. That's right. He had already stated how that was going to be. Yes. Well, David had a different perspective. When he had an opportunity to kill Saul, 1 Samuel 26, he said, who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Basically, he says, if it's God's will for him to die, then God will take care of it. But anybody that ended up killing him would be guilty. That's exactly because right. The man said I, he killed him, and so David executed. That's exactly right. He'd he'd already he'd already said this is how it's going to work out. Either either he's going to die in battle, or he's going to die because he's going to grow old, or he's going to die because God's going to strike him dead. And again, you have God's providence through all of this. Remember, you're talking about Saul as far as the kingdom is concerned. It's already been rent from him years ago, right? Years have passed. And it's already been given to who? Another. This has been going on for years. And as we've read through 1 Samuel and you've seen all these events taking place and now it culminates at the end of 1 Samuel where three of the four sons are Saul, you think, well, of all things, man, why did Jonathan have to die? I don't know, because that's that's God's providence. That's God's plan to take this family, this man and his sons, and to remove them. There'll be one more, but that, that won't be much of, a, of, a, of an obstacle. And to get them out of the way, because it's now time for David. All this while, David, for 20 years, has basically had this thought in the back of his head, well, someday I'm going to be king. And yet you've seen nothing on his part as far as rushing that. He doesn't grab the crown and put it on his head immediately and say, okay, I'm king. In fact, as you even go on, read along, he's going to still inquire of God, well, what, what should I do? For now, he's not even in his homeland. He's still in a foreign land. All this taking place in Ziklag. Well, his response is based, you know, it's kind of tied to one of his greatest talents, and that was his ability to write what? Huh? Yes, songs, poetry. Where do we read a lot of his songs and poetic songs and prayers? Half of them. Half of them. Brilliant. Brilliant. I remind you, the two greatest feats of David. Number one is the expansion of his kingdom. The kingdom of Israel expanded more in David's reign than any other king's reign. Unbelievable accomplishment by a king leading a people. Second was the writing of the Psalms. And if you've heard me give that to you before, you know I've said that the second is greater than the first. Why? Because we're still reading the Psalms. His expansion of that kingdom means nothing to us. But the preserved, holy word of God, the things that he wrote, inspired to write, we're still on Wednesday night going from this verse to that verse to that verse to that verse, all doing reading these great writings of a man. And here he is overcome with grief. He's lost his best friend. He's lamenting over the lamentation, verse 17. He wrote this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Remember, a man after God's own heart. One of the things that you're going to see, male or female, when you're after God's own heart, you're going to see a heart of love. 1 Corinthians 13, it is going to fit you like a veal. That's what you're going to see. And that's what you see in this man's life. You know he's not perfect. He's already had, he's already had some things that he's been, he's been living amongst heathens. He was someone who raided and maraudered, killed, seemingly just for the spoil. 
And we're not even talking about what lies ahead in his life. But he loved. He loved even those who tried to kill him. And now he sits down and he writes this song of the bow. The glory, thy glory, O Israel, verse 19, is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath, not in the land of the Philistines. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, area where that happened, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, neither fields of offering. For there the shield of the mighty was vilely cast away, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet delicately, who put ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Jonathan is slain upon the high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hath thou been to me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? What stands out? So what if you lived back during this time? What if you've been a witness to some of these things? What if you've been one of these 400 or 600 men that have been traveling with David? And you've seen time and time again Saul and his pursuit of David. And you saw David returning that with favor with love, with mercy, trying to get Saul to reason, to come to his senses. And then finally, Saul's dead. And for a moment in your mind, you're going, well, it's about time. And then David begins to compose this poem, this song, and it's read to you for the first time on the heels of what's just happened. Would you not be impressed? Would you not hear these things read and you're going, are you kidding me? Who is this man? How is that possible that he's got that kind of a heart in light of what that man did to him? Well, on his own, it's not possible. But serving God, it is. What else impressed you in the poem, in the song? What about his relationship with Jonathan? How is it that David concluded that his relationship with, with Jonathan, the love that they had, the love that he had for Jonathan, even seemingly exceeded any love he had for a woman? Let me, yes, Brother George. I don't remember where it said. They were. That's exactly right. Shortly after, shortly after he killed Goliath and came back and stood before Saul. And Jonathan had witnessed all of that. And it said then that Jonathan's heart was knit to Saul and I mean to, to David. Yes. The first time you hear of David taken, he has had one wife that basically he didn't really seemingly get to spend a lot of time with. And then she's given to someone else. She's going to come back into the picture. But the next thing, next thing you know, he, he goes and he takes care of some guy who is a fool. And he takes him for a wife there and he takes another. So the first time we hear anything, he's got already at least two wives, right? And he had one who was Saul's daughter who was his wife, and then she's not his wife, but maybe she's going to be his wife again. Is it possible, because David did not take one woman, as the book of Genesis tells us, and love just one woman? Sorry? Yeah, there'll be more. That could be why, again, 
Jonathan's friendship and the love he had for him was greater than he had. Or maybe it was just something that he wrote from the standpoint of just how great his love was for him. He notes, he notes how what kind of warriors they were as far as swift, as far as strong. Again, he talks about how Jonathan and his dad, even though it was not true during their lifetime, in the end, they were, were united. They were fighting together. He says three times, how are the mighty fallen? Any comments on what David wrote? Yes, sir, Brother George. No, but I don't think we would just because of the not being translated to the Greek language yet. So I'm assuming it would be like in, so I don't know that, George. Absolutely. Sister Bobby? More, good point. More than likely, again, David has spent more time with Jonathan than he had with any of these women so far. And again, the bond that they had based upon what they had been through, what Jonathan had done, and how he had stood up for David. Again, it was just a great friendship for David to have. Again, no doubt, one that we as men ought to look at and be uh, either thankful that we have someone like that in our lives, or praying that God would bring someone like that in our lives. Obviously, nothing wrong with us as men having a love for other men and being able to tell those men based upon that relationship sometimes that we love them. Be kind of uh, not sure, depending on what generation you were raised in, that may be a little challenging. You may find other ways of doing it. Maybe you're just going to. I don't know. Maybe you're going to just send the thumbs up or something on your phone, you know? Yes, Brother Jim. So think about what he said. We read that and we're going, well, how did he ever conclude that? Because probably we'd say 80% of the evidence says that that can't be true. But let's just say there was 20% of the time when David was, was knowing Saul that they had really some good times, things that we don't even know about. What's David choosing to do at this moment? He's looking at the good. You know what? This is after someone has passed. Saul can't even stand up for himself and defend himself anymore. We have been to funerals and we're going to go to more. And you know what? There's a lesson here for us. Because the tendency, depending on how you've been affected, hurt, is that you're still embittered toward the one who now is gone. See, David made a choice. He chose not to be bitter. He chose to just get better. That's what he did. And even when there was someone who would say, you know what, he is fair game. He has got every right to say this, this, and this in this moment. He took what we would call the high road. He took the godly road. He trusted in God that, you know what, whatever, as it pertains to Saul, God will take care of that. Or now God has taken care of that. I tell you, it's, it is a powerful lesson that at this point, based upon something like that, that you could come to this conclusion 
and emphasize, even if there was just a little good, and basically say as far as those other things are concerned, not going to mention them. Well, it came to pass, chapter 2, that David inquired after this, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? He's not in Israel. He's still in the land of the Philistines. And the Lord's answer was, Yes, go up. Well, where should I go? And he said, you go up to Judah. And so he takes his family and he goes to Judah and he settles in the city of Hebron. And he's going to be there for a while. And the men of Judah came and there they, David doesn't go there and says, I'm here now and it's time for me to be king. He just goes to where God tells him to go. And the men of Judah came and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And as was mentioned earlier, they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead. Look at this. Said, Blessed be you of Jehovah, that you have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now Jehovah show kindness and truth unto you, and I will also requite you for this kindness because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strong and be ye valiant, for Saul your Lord is dead, and also the house of Judah hath anointed me to be king over them. Powerful. The examples that he set, the trickle-down effect of hearing this. He did what? He said what to these people because they did what? Great lessons for us to learn. Any final comments on what we've looked at? Boy, we came a long way with Saul, did we not? And we, we, we emphasized it. We emphasized it for the purpose of making sure that we all look to ourselves and make sure that we keep the law of the Lord close to us. That we think about it, we read from it so that we might maintain that relationship with God because, boy, when Saul lost that, he began to drift, and boy, the end result was, uh, was tragic. We will pick up there three weeks from today. Next week, we have a gospel meeting. Two weeks from today, Kath and I will not be here. So, Lord willing, three weeks from today, chapter 2, verse 8, Abner is going to take Saul's other son, and yeah, it all begins again. So, all right. Thank you so much.